Yeah, by the time this podcast is over, by the time we're done done talking about this historical event, who knows what will have transpired outside these the walls of our podcast. Hello and welcome to the 28th episode of Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon reading group series. Today is Monday the 26th of April 2021 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This is the penultimate episode of our premiere series, part 28 of 29, Gee Whiz. This week I have the new patrons Neve MacDonald, Arnold Schroeder, C. Kelly, Kevin, the returning Larry McNeely and Bobby Shonger, and C. McGee, who'd signed up for the year to thank. If you like the sound of extra patron only episodes, hanging out with us all over on the Emancipation Network Discord server, or joining in the new patrons only Fundamental Principles of Communist Production and Distribution reading group, why not head over to the patron and throw me a few commie dollars? Your continued support really does help to keep the episodes flowing and food on the table. Okay, well let's hit it. Who wants to read the first one? Kyle, how do you feel? Are you talking? Sure, let's go. Historical tradition gave rise to the French peasant's belief in the miracle that a man named Napoleon would bring all glory back to them. And there turned up an individual who claims to be that man because he bears the name Napoleon in consequence of the Code Napoleon, which decrees inquiry into paternity is forbidden. That good old Napoleonic misogyny. After a 20-year vagabondage and a series of grotesque adventures, the legend is consummated, and the man becomes emperor of the French. The fixed idea of the nephew was realized because it coincided with the fixed idea of the most numerous class of the French people. But, it may be objected, what about the peasant uprisings in half of France? The raids of the army on the peasants? The mass incarceration and transportation of the peasants? Since Louis XIV, France has experienced no similar persecution of the peasants on account of demagogic agitation. But let us not misunderstand. The Bonaparte dynasty represents not the revolutionary, but the conservative peasant. Not the peasant who strikes out beyond the condition of his social existence, the small holding, but rather one who wants to consolidate his holding. Not the country folk who in alliance with the towns want to overthrow the old order through their own energies, but on the contrary, those who in solid seclusion within this old order want to see themselves and their small holding saved and favored by the ghost of the empire. It represents not the enlightenment, but the superstition of the peasant, Not his judgment, but his prejudice. Not his future, but his past. Uh, Not his modern Cévennes, a peasant uprising in the Cévennes Mountains in 1702 to 1705, but his modern Vendée. You know, I think we all know what the Vendée is. The three years stern rule of the parliamentary republic freed a part of the French peasants from the Napoleonic illusion and revolutionized them, even though superficially. But the bourgeoisie violently repulsed them as often as they set themselves in motion. Under the parliamentary republic, the modern and the traditional consciousness of the French peasant contended for mastery. The process took the form of an incessant struggle between the schoolmasters and the priests. The bourgeoisie struck down the schoolmasters. The peasants for the first time made efforts to behave independently vis-a-vis the government. This was shown in the continual conflict between the mayors and the prefects. The bourgeoisie deposed the mayors. Finally, during the period of the parliamentary republic, the peasants of different localities rose against their own offspring, the army. The bourgeoisie punished these peasants with sieges and executions. And this same bourgeoisie now cries out against the stupidity of the masses, the vile multitude that betrayed it to Bonaparte. The bourgeoisie itself has violently strengthened the imperialism of the peasant class. It has preserved the conditions that form the birthplaces of this species of peasant religion. The bourgeoisie, in truth, is bound to fear the stupidity of the masses so long as they remain conservative and the insight of the masses as soon as they become revolutionary. You know, this here, to me, is some pretty heavy 
pretty heavy support for the Bolshevik slash Stalinist line about the peasantry. Well, it's not even just the Bolshevik slash Stalinist line. This, you know, really complicates the image of Marx being for the industrial proletariat and, you know, the Bakuninists and Mao and, you know, everyone else being for the peasantry and that Marx just thought that the peasantry was a sack of potatoes. Like, despite the fact that he thinks this and that about the ideal average of the class interest or whatever, like all the things that we are going through on that checklist, Mm -hmm. Marx has a sense of political contingency that, like, can flower beyond the class interest. It's very clear. And that this isn't like a schizoid manner of thinking where he's just jamming together ideas that don't hang together. At least I don't believe so. I think he's pulling out, you know, what we could look at as some sort of like abstract, like rational choice matrix, and then throwing, you know, a sort of like cultural historical look at how people can look beyond that, you know, naked, narrow class interest or how they could be suckered into a reactionary project. Yeah, and I, I think what Marx is kind of saying here is that this revolutionary side of the peasantry is the yes. side of the peasantry that that is trying to get beyond their peasantness. Yes, right. And 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 the conservative one is the one that is trying to remain as peasants, even though they more or less cannot. Yeah, but like you know, it flow like in the previous dis- the previous description where he's describing the peasant class interest, that really applies to the peasants who are trying to remain peasants. And this is this is the 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 the, the revolutionary side is the one that is like, well, you know, we don't really know what's going to come after this for us, but we are on the side of enlightenment and al- alliance with the cities. Yeah, and perhaps like if we if we were to take this into you know naked uh, political economic terms, like maybe they think that it's you know a rational bet that they're going to end up getting more by mm-hmm. throwing their lot in with the proletariat in a revolutionary fashion than they will be able to trying to hold on to a form that's being constantly undermined. It reminds me a lot of the distinction that Lenin draws between the peasant and the farmer. Hmm. Like, as in the farmer is someone who makes use of science, is on the side of enlightenment, sees the the interest and the value of revolutionizing the countryside. Now, when when you look at what he's drawing on, he's drawing on the example of the American farmer. So, like, that's an example of settler colonialism, which may what? not actually apply. That might may not actually apply to this this case at all. But it is the kind of vision that Lenin had in mind for, like, you know, what the countryside might end up becoming. It's it's the yeah. kind of people that my my dad used to work for, as like you know, kind of like doing agricultural annex work as a government scientist. Right. You know, the kind of people that my dad was working for were a kind of transition form. They were people who had re- had had taken or bought or received land from the government through the process of settler colonialism and were basically smallholders, but were operating with the assistance of government uh, science and support in order to create a new productive form that was distinct from the old traditional ones. And those people have huh. largely ceased to exist at this point. They've, they've become like the, 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 because of free trade with America and because of the withdrawal of government support, like they've largely sold their farms to big bourgeois farm interests. But it, it was a transitional form that existed in which, you know, my, my father's job was set up to support. And it, it, wasn't, it wasn't big bourgeois farming because like really my, in the end, my dad didn't have much of any relevance to that form of farming. Uh, and and, and the, the sorts of people he worked with, their jobs were cut because we were, we were transitioning to a big 
big bourgeois slash corporate form of agriculture. Yeah. All right. Um, after the first revolution had transformed the semi-feudal peasants into freeholders, Napoleon confirmed and regulated the conditions in which they could exploit, undisturb the soil of France, which they had only just acquired, and could slake their youthful passion for property. But what is now ruining the French peasant is his small holding itself, the division of the land and the soil, the property form which Napoleon consolidated in France. It is exactly these material conditions which made the feudal peasant a small holding peasant and Napoleon an emperor. Two generations sufficed to produce the unavoidable result. Progressive deterioration of agriculture and progressive indebtedness of the agriculturist. The Napoleonic property form, which at the beginning of the 19th century was the condition of the emancipation and enrichment of the French country folk, has developed in the course of the century into the law of their enslavement and their pauperism. And just this law is the first of the Napoleonic ideas which the second Bonaparte has to uphold. If he still shares with the peasants the illusion that the cause of their ruin is to be sought, not in the small holdings themselves, but outside them, in the influence of secondary circumstances, his experiments will shatter like soap bubbles when they come into contact with the relations of production. The economic development of small holding property has radically changed the peasants' relations with the other social classes. Under Napoleon, the fragmentation of the land in the countryside supplemented free competition and the beginning of big industry in the towns. The peasant class was the ubiquitous protest against the recently overthrown landed aristocracy. The roots that small holding property struck in French soil deprived feudalism of all nourishment. The landmarks of this property formed the natural fortification of the bourgeoisie against any surprise attack by its old overlords. But in the course of the 19th century, the urban usurer replaced a feudal one, the mortgage replaced the feudal obligation, bourgeois capital replaced aristocratic landed property. The peasant's small holding is now the only pretext that allows the capitalist to draw profits, interest, and rent from the soil, while leaving it to the agriculturalist himself to see to it how he can extract his wages. The mortgage debt burdening the soil of France imposes on the French peasantry an amount of interest equal to the annual interest on the entire British national debt. Smallholding property in this enslavement by capital towards which its development pushes it unavoidably has transformed the mass of the French nation into troglodytes. <sighs> 16 million peasants, including women and children, dwell in caves, a large number of which have but one opening, others two, and the most favored only three. Windows are to a house what the five senses are to a head. The bourgeois order which at the beginning of the century set the state to stand guard over the newly emerged small holdings and fertilize them with laurels, has become a vampire which sucks from their hearts and brains and casts them into the alchemist's cauldron of capital. The Code Napoleon is now nothing but the codex of distraints, of forced sales and compulsory auctions. To the four million, including children, etc., officially recognized, Paupers, vagabonds, criminals, and prostitutes in France must be added another 5 million who hover on the margin of existence and either have their haunts in the countryside itself or with their rags and their children continually desert the countryside for the towns and the towns for the countryside. Therefore, the interests of the peasants are no longer, as under Napoleon, in accord with, but are now in opposition to, bourgeois interests to capital. Hence, they find their natural ally and leader in the urban proletariat whose task it is to overthrow the bourgeois order. But strong and unlimited government, and this is the second Napoleonic idea that the second Napoleon has to carry out, is called upon to defend this material order by force. This material order also serves in all Bonaparte's proclamations as the slogan against the rebellious peasants. I mean, Kyle, I just see a lot more fuel for what you're saying here about the the alliance between the proletariat and the peasantry kind of against mm -hmm. this like Trotskyist sort of read where, mm -hmm. you know, there is no role for the peasantry to play and all of the backwardsness can be blamed on the peasants um, yeah. that Marx was really, and you see this in Marx throughout that he is actually in favor of, of class coalitions in the proletarian interest, 
right? Mm -hmm. Like as long yes. as it can still be steered by the proletarian interests, he's not against coalitions with the petty bourgeoisie. He's not against coalitions with the peasants. He expects there to be forward thinking elements within other classes, within their ranks. And he just does not see consciousness going one-to-one -one with class interests. And if he did, his entire project would be in, in ruins and incoherent. It's just like a really bad way of reading Marx. Right. So I do have a, another point to bring up here. How much does this situation that Marx describes of like the Napoleonic land reform leading to impoverishment correspond to the situation in America with the idea of everyone being a homeowner now leading to just mass pauperization and like this 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 same kind of dispossession like is it is it a is it a kind of analogous outcome i can't get that out of my head when i read it that is the substitution that i often make and maybe it's a sort of presentist mistake kyle but i absolutely do see it that way that you know oh there you know it's the attack on the middle class and it is by the same forces that propped up the middle class and it is ultimately for the uh, for the same like ultimate long-term reasons, but the political calculus has changed against the favor of bolstering small holding property, you know, for settler colonial reasons, for, you know, post-war compromise reasons, that the conditions for that calculus have faded and you now have an attack on those people. And th that's essentially what leaves the national narrative and especially the sort of liberals in mm -hmm. complete disarray. They just have no point of reference for understanding what's going on. And I mean the, liberals quite broadly. In the Clinton era, they sort of doubled down on the idea of putting this uh, pro like small property holder republic into overdrive, right? Yeah. Through an alliance with finance to just like extend it at, to, the, to the, the broadest extent possible. And then that started all this disintegration. It's the same, like, you know, I think obviously the American small farm holders have definitely gone the way of the French farm holders that he's, he's said here. But like, I think it's For sure. like, if, if you look at the structure of the housing market, I think like post-war, there seem to have been like, you know, limits. Uh, certainly I know in Ireland and England, there was limits in the amount of money you could get for a mortgage was tied to like three times your wages. But like the, I, the this necessity for, for capital to be able to get large profits, <laughs> you can't get it in production here, but you can get it in speculation here. And the banks always go for speculative fucking gains. It's quicker. So like, I think that natural kind of nearly... You, this this same thing as uh, has kind of happened, I would say, Kyle. As in, like these small holders, they they own their property, did they not in France yes. here? But the way, and they ended up getting indebted, like in 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 a lot of like the as a I suppose as a class, the proletariat in in most Western countries probably owned. If you go back fifty years ago, they probably owned their houses. Is that a fair comment? Yes, so. uh, with like sort or, of minor exceptions like Germany to a considerable extent, Japan. Maybe Austria, uh, I think maybe as well. Yeah, but in many, yeah, Austria is another one, you're right. But uh, in, in most countries, I would say that home ownership was quite high in the post-war compromise. Yeah, and, and even so, like, Home ownership is, it's probably very important in those countries. I don't mean to undersell that, but in the United States, home ownership was the linchpin of the post-war compromise in an even more pronounced way. May, I don't know, maybe I'm inflating this because of my bias of being American. And no, seeing you're it right, close. you're right. But, but I think, yeah, like it, it is. And this is actually a dynamic that Engels was very perceptive about. And Marx was always more sanguine about the United States than Engels because I think Engels understood the implications of this for what the, you know, the limits of the labor movement here. Yeah. I mean, obviously if, if we're going to talk about like farmers in the United States, yeah, this, this dynamic is like way, way far gone. It's, it's pretty much years. impossible. Yeah. 50, 70 years ago, 
<laughs> yeah, well, yeah, right. But like to, to abstract this a bit and to make this a little more about the Marxian dynamic of class polarization, which, you know, in the literature, people have been very like, haha, well, we see now that there's no class polarization in capitalism. Um, even and even sort of like the more responsible, like I don't know, analytical Marxists, you know, un until recently, like w would say things like that. Oh, you know, it's so much more complicated than class polarization. And while there might be, they might be right to a degree. Like ultimate, the ultimate tendency is to liquidate these medium forms. I, I think it's just so hard not to look at. It's just so hard to look at the overall dynamics of the economy. And the way that the housing market crash just essentially destroyed the American like class compromise, you know, and beyond the point of just like allowing like expanding the realm of whiteness or like allowing minorities to buy into it or or whatever, like the 2007 and, you know, through eight like financial and housing crash, the effects of that are still not really registered in the American psyche in that like, not only is the expanding standards of living over, but the entire frame of reference for the like American political situation is gone. And so like w when reading this stuff, it is hard not to see, it's, it's hard not to like read our, our present situation into that and that there are, and I, I don't know if I could even be as, as sanguine as Marx is about the peasantry in terms of the, you know, the, <laughs> the middle class that feels itself being liquidated and is looking towards the proletariat as it's like for leadership or something like maybe that the main thing about the middle class is like liquidated properties that it still sees itself as the master of the proletariat and trying to, you know, desperately grasp at the reins and, you know, maintain moral order because the, you know, the sort of petty bourgeois are the, are supposed to be like the moral exemplars of the proletariat. And they can't like let go of that self image in their descent into proletarianization. Well, yeah, but the, the home ownership went far broader than the petty bourgeoisie. It was, yeah. you know, no, it was, no, no, it was, no. You're, you're, you're quite right. You're, no, you're yeah. quite right about that. And it's going to push the the, the the kind of richer pros, you know, maybe skilled pros down. What it, what it will mean is that like house prices got got smashed, they lose them, but house prices come back up, and then they can't get back on the ladder. People's kids can't get on the ladder. You're going to a state of home ownership over 70, 80 years. It'll go to a state of rentership, mm -hmm. you know, and and that's the key dynamic, like for pros here that maps from like a, a land owning to basically, you know, not having the land, you know, we're, we're going to be going to a, a rental, a renting proletariat. I think it's definitely on the increase. Oh, um, no, that, that's, that's absolutely, uh, it's, it, it's to a large extent, people either living in with relatives who still have homes or renting is the, is the overwhelming yes. tendency. Even that ability to to live with where your folks are, whatever. Like most people, you know, house their folks' house doesn't doesn't get them close to where they work. You know, it's not a mm. it's not a solution. It's not a systemic solution. The other thing I want to bring up here is this relationship, like the Napoleon who creates uh, the petty property, and then the Napoleon who is forced to turn against it or against those who are dispossessed. Like, we've been talking about the 18th Brumaire of Joe Biden. You know, <laughs> is this the position that the Democrats are in now? Yes. Yeah. Like, yeah. they created the petty proprietor republic, and now as it falls apart, they are forced into this law and order position in opposition to those who are dispossessed? Yeah, I think that is exactly where they end up being. And I mean, you know... It's we could talk about the class forces abstracted from each of the parties or whatever, because, you know, if you really think about the grand sweep of the democratic party, it's sort of abstracted from the uh, industrial bourgeois that supported the Republicans or whatever. There's always been more of a sort of, I don't know. How would you, how would you describe the split between, you know, like the long-term trends and Democrats and Republicans? Like 
It's complicated right. because they, the parties sort of switch sides, but there are some, there's, there's like a substrate that like retains itself. But yeah, ultimately like, especially the Democrats that like bolstered like redlining and bolstered, you know, the racial elements of the post-war welfare state, there is a big turn against. Even though uh, <laughs> basically the uh, negative effect on property values of having black people <laughs> move into your neighborhood is now worse than ever, uh, wow. which is really, it just makes you despair when you think about that. It does, it does point to this entire way of life being like against not just like the class interests of the proletariat, but like the values, of the enlightenment. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah. or the values of humanism beyond the enlightenment, because I guess really the values of the enlightenment. Are yeah. The values of enlightenment are totally, yeah, totally yeah, 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 yeah. consistent with. <laughs> right. With the black, with uh, property values going down when, you know, and, and racial segregation down. in general. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, I don't know if they're totally consistent, but politically speaking and in terms of what the enlightenment did, that's the foundation of that shit. There's always a split between, you know, the actual political projects that the Enlightenment is tied to and the, the humanist spirit that is, you know, played out through French history, especially the universalist ideas that ended up getting like a really bad reputation in the United States because they had to make a pact with slaveholders are certainly not compatible with this way of life, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's do the next bit. I'll read this bit, sure. In addition to the mortgage, which capital imposes on it, the small holding is burdened by taxes. Taxes are the life source of the bureaucracy, the army, the priests, and the court. In short, of the entire apparatus of the executive power. Strong government and heavy taxes are identical. By its very nature, small holding property forms a basis for an all-powerful and numberless bureaucracy. It creates a uniform level of personal and economic relationships over the whole extent of the country. Hence, it also permits uniform action from a supreme centre on all points of this uniform mass. It destroys the aristocratic immediate steps between the mass of the people and the power of the state. On all sides, therefore, it calls forth the direct intrusion of this state power and the interposition of its immediate organs. Finally, it produces an unemployed surplus population which can find no place either on the land or in the towns and which perforce reaches out for state offices as a sort of respectable alms and provokes the creation of additional state positions. By the new markets which he opened with bayonets and by the plundering of the continent, Napoleon repaid the compulsory taxes with interest. These taxes were a spur to the industry of the peasant whereas now they rob his industry of its last resources and complete his defencelessness against pauperism. An enormous bureaucracy, well gallooned and well fed, is the Napoleonic idea, which is most congenial to the second Bonaparte. How could it be otherwise, considering that alongside the actual classes of society, he is forced to create an artificial caste for which the maintenance of his regime becomes a bread and butter question? Hence. One of his first financial operations was the raising of official salaries to their old level and the creation of new sinecures. Oh, my. This is so <laughs> interesting. You know, it's incredible. I, I, I love it because it's saying something very interesting in relation to sort of like contemporary American society, right? Like the sort of Trumpites, the the petty proprietors who hate, quote unquote, big government, like their form of property is actually the precondition for its existence. The small holding property is the basis of big government, according yeah. to Marx here. Yeah. Which, which, which makes sense because the big bourgeoisie can actually defend itself from taxation whereas small property they can't yeah marx gets so many dynamics right here it's kind of funny because on the one hand you know a libertarian would love you know a right libertarian you know would love the sentence strong government and heavy taxes are identical but then just shit himself over the next sentences 
that like far from being the guarantor of democracy and the check on the big state, this small proprietorship is the condition for the big state to really like rule the roost. And perhaps, you know, some conditions of the Soviet Union where the government owns like fucking all industries or something, or, you know, a great deal, you know, could be the counterexample. But like, in general, you don't actually see small property holding being this like virtuous classical form of like, I don't know, liberty protection. You do see it create a surplus population that calls out for more state spending because yeah, small proprietorship, that's not going to include everybody. That's impossible. Like that's kind of the point of small proprietorship is to not include everyone. (laughs) Yeah. It's so interesting because it's like, it makes sense the way the, the weird dual consciousness of the small proprietors where they hate big government but love the military is yeah. very much explained in this description of how the first Napoleon actually benefited the small proprietor through the use of taxes. That's very interesting, Kyle. Yeah. So like the, like, you know, the, the society, these small propriety holders benefit from the imperial surplus. So they like the military. Mm-hmm. Yeah, There's at least the possibility they will benefit. It, it, it like there is a a tantalizing hope that they will see gains from the use of the military through imperialism, even if they don't always see it. It's like, yeah, like there's a logic there. Yeah, this gets the small proprietor relationship to what would eventually become like military Keynesianism, which would become, you know, chartalism for Hitler's policy. And, you know, what would become like the you know, World War II full mobilization kind of spending. It's fucking fascinating. It's basically right there. By the new markets which he opened with bayonets and by the plundering of the continent, Napoleon repaid the compulsory taxes with interest. These taxes were a spur to the industry of the peasant. Now they rob his industry of his last resources and complete his defenselessness against pauperism. Even that bit. Yeah, like, Like, because... like The military now is, is, like, it's a leech. It's a leech on society now, it seems. Yeah, and it's one of the biggest expenditures, tax expenditures. And yeah, you do really see like something like this, you know, middle class tax burden. You know, this was like a big progressive like talking point. But like, yeah, like the way that, you know, if you're if you're doing property taxes, they will, yeah, disproportionately affect the people of the least property and, you know, force them out of that realm. So, I mean, like, you know, without like shedding too many tears about that, you have a small proprietor is, again... This is a tendency towards class polarization. And the Republican versus Democratic politics are the politics of the small proprietors versus the politics of the people who are on the state payroll, pretty yeah, much. Pretty and much. and the, the that's where that political contradiction comes out. And it's very interesting, you know, with the thing like, oh, Trump doesn't pay tax, right? And it's like, well, for for the liberals and for the Democrats, it's like, ha ha, you know, like <laughs> he doesn't pay tax. That's that's not contributing to society. It's 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 an embarrassment. But you can kind of understand how for the petty proprietors, it's like, what a hero, man. Like, I wish I didn't have to pay that tax. <laughs> you know, yeah, like. Trump doing it for the boys. Yeah, yeah. They say, you know, they say death and taxes is inevitable, but god damn it, you know, you might succumb to COVID, but you're not paying taxes. <laughs> yeah. For Donald Trump, only one thing in in life is inevitable. Death. <laughs> Via COVID. You know, he got out of one of those boxes, so he's a real hero. <laughs> But no, it's, that, it's fascinating because this this paragraph really is illuminating as to like what the actual political dynamic is in America. Like it it it, it maps on very strongly with what Marx is describing here. There's a little bit on secularization here that I don't know if it's like important enough to read, but there is just this little bit that's like 
Heaven was a quite pleasing addition to the narrow strip of land just won, especially as it makes the weather. It becomes an insult as soon as it is thrust forward as a substitute for the small holding. It does kind of like track with secularization in the United States accompanying this loss of the small property holder. Yeah, let's let's read this because this is kind of incredible. Like, do you want to read it there, Esri? Yeah, yeah, I got it. Another Napoleonic idea is the domination of the priests as an instrument of government. But while at the time of their emergence, the small holding owners in accord with society and their dependence on natural forces and submission to the authority which protected them from above were naturally religious, now that they are ruined by debts at odds with society and authority and driven beyond their own limitations, they have become naturally irreligious. Heaven was quite a pleasing addition to the narrow strip of land just won, especially as it makes the weather. It becomes an insult as soon as it is thrust forward as a substitute for the small holding. The priest then appears only as the anointed bloodhound of the earthly police, another Napoleonic idea. The expedition against Rome will take place in France itself next time, but in a sense, opposite from that of Monsieur de Montalembert. I So I think... This is a little bit more complicated if we want to look at the American example, right? Because certainly the the secularization actually starts at the height of petty property. Yes, that's right? true. Yeah. During the exposure to the state universities and the, the the boomers, right? The boomers. Yeah, that's when it really accelerates. I think you may actually be able to kind of extend this sort of logic though in terms of like maybe not the priesthood quote unquote because obviously like that's not a super major political force in america but maybe like the ngo sector something like that like that are that, that are doing like the old job of the catholic church that's maybe like uh a more grounded read than what I was looking at. I was just sort of thinking about the influence of evangelicals in policy and in politics, because like we said earlier, Trump dying of COVID is the last chance for evangelicals to have a, an evangelical president. Like right. the old days of the moral majority are gone. What is most striking about a lot of the alt right to a lot of people is that they are post-religious. They would, they would troll conservatives by you know, posting pictures of aborted fetuses and that sort of thing. That's, that's mm-hmm. a pretty new phenomenon in American politics to be openly nihilistic instead of, you know, mm-hmm. using Christianity as a shield for all the oppressive politics that the, you, you have. So in that respect, like the crisis brought out the irreligious right in, in a way that yeah, you, yeah, you haven't I- seen. I think what you see of the boomers is that a portion of them go into evangelical Christianity, right? As like a reaction to the sixties. Yes. And a portion of them go into the NGO complex, you know, like this kind of idea of like, like neoliberal civil society theory. Right. Okay. Like yeah. That that's that sort of captures their aspirations uh, spiritually, and I, I I think honestly both of them are degenerating at this point in time of disenfranchisement. I think that's right. Cer- yeah, certainly the nonprofits as an instrument of government have become like less. <laughs> they, there's like less social trust in them, and they've become like less useful. But the the point I was kind of thinking here, I don't know if you've covered it there. I just had to go uh, to step out for a second. Was was along mm. the lines of like. The recent, fairly recent, like graphs for like those who consider themselves non-religious in the U.S. has been like going up at, I think, nearly like a one percentage point a year or something for like ten yes. or twelve years. That it's, it's up cool. to like something like twenty percent now or twenty-five percent. I can't remember the exact stats. Do you know them, Esri? I don't know the exact stats, but I, I, I was something of a. Uh new atheist adjacent person 10 years ago. So I was kind of aware when this phenomenon was beginning and quite happy about it. And Um, it's still ongoing. The last one I saw was this year or last year. And the trend is still like a line. It's just going straight up. And that would track with like this idea of the destruction of the 
you know, the peasant small holding, if we want to make that analogy we had for the... Well, the petty know, proprietor. Owner. Yeah, uh, but like, not even just petty, yeah. petty, petty, yeah. petty proprietor. Yeah, petty proprietor is the small property but, holder. It's it's hard to make an abstraction outdoor. between, yeah, like means yeah. of production holder and someone that like owns where they live. Yeah, like what we were saying, like... There's the, still means of production. There's still yeah. means of production. It's just, but, well, it's a very small one compared to the overall... For for but for a lot of like proletarians, like where they live, isn't there like uh, it doesn't That's have true. anything to That's do with true. production, but it does have a sort of ideological impact in feeling like you have a stake in society and feeling like a property holder. It gives you a sense of that you have an interest in small property holdings, which you know a yeah, lot I of proletarians think. just don't on the job. Like, the, mm. like that's just not true in terms of their employment relations, but like they can come home to their own castle and that yeah. means something to them. Yeah. Like, I, I, I guess think... I, I just have too much COVID brain because for a lot of people right now, no, that, that makes they're sense. working from home. So it, it actually is means of production. That does make yeah. sense. But you know, that is, we'll see if that's like a lasting achievement of the COVID revolution, you know, <laughs> it will be, don't you fucking, don't you, don't you bet? Do I mean, do bet in it. I mean, I don't know. Shut up, Tom. But like, uh, so <laughs> they're like, so I, I map that, that like this destruction of the ability to be a householder and not having a feeling like you have a position within this society is leading like to this religious, irreligious phenomenon in America, it seems to map pretty well to what they've just talked about here. Like that while the, the, the farmers were driven to become kind of proles or whatever you want to say in America, they still had that, what did he call it in the in the previous, the new, the, the markets he opened with bayonets and the plundering of the continent. Napoleon repaid the compulsory taxes with interest. They still had that boom from the US empire in the 50s, 60s, 70s that doesn't seem to be there anymore as services in the country and bridges are getting into you know disrepair and the the military is bloated that like it seems to map pretty well to me i i was i was that was something i didn't pick up reading it the first two times yeah, yeah. especially especially in regards with you know military adventurism which you know the last real big ad adventure has of course ended in disaster for the United States, but I, I mean, I suppose there are there are other like you know American excursions, but the Iraq War really being sort of a capstone on American like unilateral entanglement in in the affairs of the world and just like putting projecting its influence often you know against the cries of its allies, being like, wait, wait. Except, except not not uh, not our good friend Tony Blair. My friend waited. Tony Blair was went to Dublin to to like sign his book. He was in one of the like <laughs> the big bookshops, and he got up early on a Saturday morning. And he queued and he wore a suit and he looked all like nerdy or whatever. And when he got up to Tony Blair, I don't know if he like spat in his face or threw blood on his face. Did something? Like... <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know my hero. name. It was hero. Tony Hero. I didn't know. Best reason to wear a suit. Yeah, I was so surprised. He said, oh, I did that. And I was like, you did what? <laughs> I never knew he would do something like that. It was very surprising. You're like, he wasn't an activist or anti. He just went, fuck Tony Blair. I'm going to get him. <laughs> wow. What a, what a conscientious <laughs> human being. It's fucking brilliant. Yeah. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, 
a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. And if you'd like to help out the show, please remember to head over to Patreon and throw me a few commie dollars.